Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I would like to call the meeting of the Diversity Committee to order, please. Uh, my name is Blanca Lopez, chair of this committee, and at this time I would like to acknowledge Dr. John Ross Rizzo, my colleagues Neil Suckerman and um, Mr. Chu um, to um, our meeting, and if we could hear from the members of the public, please. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. We have four members of the public registered to speak today. As a reminder, we ask that all public speakers adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. I would also like to remind our public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware that there will be a warning beep to remind you that you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. The first speaker will be Maddie's Buck Highland, followed by Jason Anthony. Maddie Bucky's Highland, who is on Zoom. Um, am I on? Hello? Yes. Yes. All right, yes. perfect. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, folks. Um, this is Maddie Bucky's Highland, M A T T Y B U C H Y S H H Y L A N D. I would suggest, though, before I get into it, I would suggest that you correct the midst of my name. It should be M-A-T-T-Y, not M-A-D-D-I-E. Um, it, it should be B-U-C-H-Y-S and Highland, H-Y-L-A-N-D. So I would really appreciate if you can correct the minutes on that, if that's okay with the chair. Second of all, happy Autism Awareness Month, as you could see on my shirt. Um, for, for I did not speak until I was the age of four. I'm 23 right now. but. There's people out there. We need to understand that, you know, we live in a world where, where it's accessible. People, accessibility, in my view, is a, is a right, not a privilege. We can't have it be, be at multimillionaire's house. We need to build it everywhere, whether they're rich or poor or stuff like that. That accessibility should really come because people with autism do have rights like every other feelings. Anyway, that's all I'll have to say. Please make the corrections if you can. Thank you, and God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jason Anthony, followed by Kayla Hazlett. Good afternoon, Blanca. Uh, this is my ninth year being back in the Big Apple. Uh, I would love to say in the diversity committee, uh, as a native New Yorker, but being nine years being back, this is a diverse world. But I have to kind of disagree, but at the same time agree with Maddie. We have to be acceptive to one another. But at the same time, within the MTA, we have good apples, but at the same time, we have bad apples. April could be Autism Awareness Month. But people have to realize that Autism is not the only disability that could be out there. I suffer from multiple mental illnesses. And I'm doing full disclosure. That could be the one of multiple people well known inside the MTA. But we, we could have multiple disabilities. But one thing is for, is for certain, when we travel throughout the system, we could be acceptive, we could be appreciated with one another, but one thing 
is for certain that is that we need more diverse people inside the MTA. Thank you. I'll see you guys later. Our next speaker is Kayla Haslate, followed by Jesse Figueroa. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, my name is Kalia Hazlett, and I'm the president of the Sunshine Network, the one and only accessible travel training program here in New York, which, of course, with tra um, MTA having 150 new accessible stations is definitely a requirement, and we're not having the discussion enough about teaching all disabilities how to navigate mass transit. The other thing that I wanted to discuss was the transit's commitment um, to accessibility through congestion pricing. Um, one of the things is we want to make sure that the application process for um, drivers with disabilities and the special class is, is more easily accessible. Um, I know that it just came out last Friday, but we want to make sure that, uh, that uh, the, these special classes have access to those um, uh, applications and to those discounts with congesting pricing. I also wanted to, to thank Mr. Kresslow and Ms. Hudson, Hudson that just left for implementing the Slack program, which is uh, definitely uh, furthering accessibility in, um, in transit, in the transit system, which we need. I'm always striving for new signage, new lighting, um, updates in elevators. Um, and escalators and um, the conductor station, which we know a lot of stations are, have been outdated and it's not the old transit anymore, it's the new transit. And I'm so glad that leadership is um, working hard to understand that travelers with disabilities are part of the system and they are working hard to uh, make it accessible. Thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker is Jesse Figueroa, followed by Aletha Dupree. Good afternoon, everybody. Jesse Figueroa here, U.S. Army veteran and member of the Long Island Railroad Accessibility Task Force. I'm here to speak about um, disabilities. I am a, a veteran with PTSD and autism and a couple of physical disabilities myself. Um, I'm also here to speak in defense of a 16-year-old boy. Um, two Fridays ago on the Q48 bus around early in the morning on his way to school. He has a disability and um, and he was called derogatory names by a bus operator whom I had reported on the MTA app and that is a total disrespect on a passenger, especially children and youth who have disabilities, and it breaks my heart that way. Other than that, um, I support diversity in our system. We just need more and more people to step up to the plate. So if you see something, say something. You have the help, uh, the help point or call 311 for city info 511 if no if anybody doesn't want to use the MTA app or in real dire emergencies call 911 thank you our final speaker is Aletha Dupree um, thank you uh, good afternoon um, uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her with Team Folds. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, your chair, Blanca, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about this report that I have. Uh, it's basically about staff demographics. And we generally do a good job as, uh, with our demographics, but uh, I think we're still missing some pieces of diversity. So I, I have this here. We use terms separations by sex. That, that language concerns me. It's, I have this thing with the little blue and uh, pink discs. Um, separation, females, males. Perpetuating with blue and pink? I think we should look at our color palette. But what's even more concerning is 
We are an organization with almost 70,000 employees. And we have it broken down by male and female. D does this mean that we have no non-binary members in our organization? I have a little trouble buying that. But yet we're not tracking this. And so why do I say these things? because it is how we chart our demographics that can affect how employees deal with the public. Uh, because I am different and I don't fit definitions, that may, there are many who don't know what to do with me. So I bring this up. Uh, I think we should have unisex bathrooms in the MTA. Because for some people, to, to paraphrase the old saying, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Uh, that ca I think that came out in the 19, I mean in the 1600s. So I, I advocate for us to be an organization that serves everybody equally. No one should be disrespected at the door. It stops now. I refer to BART being the people's system, and I think we need to work on our demographics to be more inclusive. Thank you. Madam Chair, that concludes the public comment section. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that, and thank you to this afternoon's speakers. Everybody knows that this committee meets on a quarterly basis. Therefore, uh, with respect to the approval of the meeting minutes, uh, we are about to approve the meeting minutes for December 18th of last year. May I have a motion, please? Thank you, Neil. Second? Any questions or comments regarding the meeting minutes? If not, all in favor? Aye. Great. Thank you. Motion passes. Meeting minutes are approved. And then moving on to the committee work plan. Um, are there any updates on the 2024 work plan, Curtis? Madam Chair, the work plan can be found on pages six through eight of the committee workbook. There are no updates at this time. Wonderful. And can you take us through the executive summary? Yes, ma'am, we'll do. Is that on the presentation? So this afternoon, I'll be leading our presentation and discussions with the support of my colleagues and the leadership team at DDCR. I will start with uh, announcing that our prior deputy chief of the Small Business Development Program, George Cleary, ret retired in February. So we are pleased to have Cherie Owens join us as acting deputy chief. Um, she's been an invaluable member of the Small Business Mentoring Team and seamlessly, seamlessly stepped into the leadership role as we seek to identify a new leader in this area. So I want to thank Cherie um, for her service. We are also joined by Deputy Chief Dr. Rosalind Green, who is also joined by two additional colleagues within our EO team, Barbara Cockfield and Alana Smith Pizarro. We have Deputy Chief Christine Norman and Deputy Chief Ray Burke, who is joining us remotely. We also have uh, other members of our DDCR team here in attendance this afternoon. Our primary agenda items will include some exciting information about the MTA's recent federal commitment to the MWDBE community, update on the revised final rule for the DBE program management and delivery, and then, of course, reporting on our program activity with respect to MWDBE activity and our small business development programs and EEO activities. I just wanted to point out two um, key important items. First is that this meeting had initially been calendared for March, and we were slated to report on data as of December 31st, 2023, at that time, or the third quarter. Um, at our next meeting, we'll be able to provide and confirm data for the full fiscal year, but as we proceed through the calendar year and our scheduled meetings, we'll hope to be back on track. So the information you'll get today is a little dated. It goes through the end of December 31st. At our next meeting in June, we'll be able to provide the full fiscal year information. And we're also going to be sharing some success stories with you this afternoon we think it's important to hear about the impact that we are having with our key MW and DBE partners. We've found it very inspiring, inspiring and hope you will feel that, feel the same. And lastly, of course, welcoming Mr. Chu to the Diversity Committee. We're looking forward to working with you. With regards to the equity and infrastructure pledge, the pledge itself is a commitment made by major transportation agencies throughout the United States, and I am pleased uh, to announce that the MTA joined all of these other transportation agencies in March of this year to make uh, three major commitments. One is to uh, award a billion dollars worth of work to MW and or DBE firms every year. Uh, this last year, as you may recall, 
the prior year, we awarded $813 million in contracts to MWBEs and $392 million in DBE firms. So we are comfortable that we will be able to meet and exceed this goal moving forward. We are also committed to awarding larger contracts to small businesses as well as expanding the pool of MW and DBE firms that we work with. And lastly, we have a commitment to increase our discretionary contracts for design and engineering of MWBE work by 20% over the next five years. So we have three major commitments, and as you can see on the screen, um, Chairman Jano uh, made an announcement at the 14th Street Station where we were joined by representatives from the National EIP Group as well as the Chicago Transit Authority, which chairs that committee. Wanted to share some key updates in the DBE program. Uh, earlier this month, the US DOT announced some key changes to the management of the DBE program, which are slated to take effect on May 9th. Uh, there was a summary memorandum that was circulated both to our internal team as well as the CND team to make sure that we are all uh, aware of the key changes and um, ensure that we're continuing our compliance. Some of the highlights include an increase to the personal net worth cap for DBE firms to 2.047 million. That's an increase up from about 1.32 million um, prior to that. It updates also the business size for participating firms to 30.72 million. And it's important to understand that that's a DBE cap, not an SBA cap. The Small Business Administration has their own uh, business size caps. It modernized rules for the counting of material suppliers. It added uh, program elements related to monitoring and oversight. It updated certification provisions. Um, it had less prescriptive rules that give certifiers some flexibility when determining eligibility. And also uh, promulgated some rules with respect to design build contracts and um, the management and compliance of that. So unfortunately, um, you know, the modest hike in the PNW won't make much of a change for us. There were no regional adjustments that were made to the DBE program, which we were hoping for. Um, you know, it's in New York City, labor, both labor and supply costs are very expensive. It's very expensive to do business here in New York. So we were hoping um, to have a, a more substantial increase to the, B, to the DBE personal net worth threshold, but we will certainly be working over the next couple of months to make sure that the DBE community within New York and, and within the MTA catchment area are aware of these new changes so that we can increase the availability of DBE certified firms, uh, which, you know, as you're aware, the MTA is a certifying authority. So with respect to MWBE and SDVOB payments, I'll ask my colleague Christine Norman to report. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> um, as, uh, as you can see, MTA is on track to exceed the New York State MWBE goals for the fourth consecutive year. We will start with the data that represents payments to MWBEs and SDBOBs for quarters one through three. As you can see, we've, been paid, we've paid out over $500 million uh, to certified MWBEs and SDBOBs. Um, there is a decrease in payments as compared to the same period um, for 22-23, but we are still achieving uh, the stated goals. Um, and then we'll move to the next quarter, the next uh, page. Thank you. Um, this represents uh, the DBE awards for 22-23, the, state, the states, the federal fiscal year is from October 2022 to uh, September 2023. So our next report on goal attainment for DBEs will be for June, all right? But this represents that we awarded 16% of, of contracts to DBE firms. It's just shy of our 20% goal, but um, we expect that the awards will pick up as contracts move forward in the design build. Okay. On the next slide, we are showing the largest MW at DBE awards and SCVOB awards to um, prime and subcontractors that are certified. Um, normally, Ray Burke, my colleague, reports this information out, but 
I will uh, represent uh, the, the primes and subcontract awards this month. Okay. Um, as you can see, CRC Associates was awarded a contract for $57 million. Um, they are performing um, various construction services, self-performing in design build um, for fire alarm systems and uh, fire sprinkler replacements, um, which is very impressive. We also have Voltamp, obviously electrical services. Um, all of the, these firms are representing uh, construction-related services with the exception of Thundercat, which is an SDVOB, and Thundercat Technology is providing to us uh, software. It's Chrono software over the next five years, and um, it's a substantial award to SDVOBs. Okay, next slide. Okay. Okay, this uh, should represent um, DBE, uh, I mean MW and SDVOB outreach for quarters one through three um, for 2023. Um, DDCR participated in over 40 outside MW and SDVOB uh, targeted outreach events that were sponsored um, by various advocacy organizations. Um, but within that, DDCR also hosted a series of events, um, including four, I mean, six DBE certification workshops and four new quarterly, uh, new firm orientations. Those uh, orientations are held quarterly, okay? Over the past nine months, we've met with over 600 uh, firms and have separated them by industry to help us consider areas for development um, Empire State Development classifies firms into four categories, commodities, construction, construction consulting, and uh, services consulting. Services consulting um, is a broad category that includes professional services, but it also includes standard services like pest management, um, rubbish removal, and, and other services. So you'll see here that our outreach uh, reached a significant number of firms in the services industry with construction-related indus industries as the second largest group. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. And we'll present the first of our two um, MTA, MWBE success stories. I'm sorry. Yes. Apologies. Could you just go back to, there was a page and then four or five go where you had the uh, total amount of spend in our target, the 16% before that, right there, thank you. Mm -hmm. yes. So the, 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 that's our award in the whole fiscal year, $392 million in fiscal year 2022-23, and then a slightly different fiscal year for New York State, of $700 million basically, right? I'm reading that, that's a total MWB awarding we did. That was uh, DBE. Okay. awards and that is prime and subcontract okay. awards and, and i think we should just because you were you were dwelling on the fact that we were below the 20 percent which obviously is our target but i yes. think we should acknowledge that the absolute dollar spend is an extraordinary amount of money like we are as an organization we are spending on capital more than we've ever i'm putting my finance hat on for a second more than we've ever spent in any era of the mta and so when you look at that number whether it's 16% or 20%, the absolute dollars flowing in the way that this committee is meant to do and the way that your department is meant to do is extraordinary. And so you could have 25% of a small number or 16% of a massive number. I'll take 16% of a massive number. So it doesn't mean there's not never more work to not do, but you should be proud of the fact that the absolute dollars flowing to DBEs is, is a very, very large number. Yes. Agreed. Agreed, and we expect those numbers to improve over time as more subcontractors are identified on the design build projects. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so, so back to Penda Aiken. Penda Aiken is one of our uh, MWBE success stories. They, Penda Aiken Incorporated provides workforce solutions for sourcing and maintaining temporary, contingent, and permanent personnel. They have about 425 associates, over 50 clients, and they have been incredibly successful with and a very key partner to the MTA over the past three years. Penda Aiken has had contracts exceeding $11.8 million, including 
uh, their ability to provide temporary medical staff for various COVID services. And so we consider Penda just an incredible uh, MWBE story, I think, for the city of New York, not just for the MTA. We also wanted to introduce Jennifer Herman of MKJ Communications. MKJ primarily works, uh, performs for the MTA as a subcontractor on several prime contracting opportunities for both state and federally funded programs. They've worked with some of the most notable contractors in the Northeast, including Skanska, Judd Lau Construction, Forte, and Sitnalta. They're performing over $50 million in subcontracted services on MTA contracts since 2020. So I think you know both Penda and Jennifer are just shining examples of the capacity of MWBE firms that can perform on our MTA contracts, and we're very pleased to be able to highlight them this afternoon. With respect to our small business development program, I'll ask my colleague Cherie Owens to make the report. Thank you, Lourdes. Good afternoon. Okay, so this slide represents the goals for the small business development program for 2023. The recruitment of new firms increased by 17%, which exceeds our overall departmental goal of 10%. And in 2023, we had 10 loans approved by BOC Capital, a new vendor that started in January of 2023 and to date, they've approved an amount of 1036760 Next slide, please. Thank you. So we wanna highlight the top prime awards in the program for 2023. Uh, for tier one, we have Sands Construction, an MBE firm, and they performed about 900,000 on a transit stair project at Freeman Station in White Plains Road. For tier two, we have RK Contracting, they uh, performed about $4.9 million for the Long Island Bethpage Employee Facility HVAC construction. And for our Small Business Federal Program, we have Orange County Engineering, a WBE and a DBE certified firm. And they performed about $2.343 million on the Spionk Parking Phase 2 project in Long Island. Can you just quickly describe what Tier 1 and Tier 2 mean? Okay, so tier, our program is broken out by Tier 1 which is uh, under the state program, tier one, which are projects up to $1.5 million, and you're in the program for five years. Tier two is you're still in the program for five, for five years, but you are allowed to bid on projects up to $5 million. And for the state program, we have the Small Business Federal Program. You're in the program for five years, and you're allowed to bid on projects, federally funded projects for up to five years. Next, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so we're currently out on the street with the RFP for the Small Business Development Program um, for a new firms or firms to manage the program. The MTA is seeking a contract with firms that will apply its construction management and oversight experience to provide guidance to small contractors in performing of the MTA's construction projects. This firm will be an independent consultant to the MTA performing these services under the title of Construction Management and Oversight Service, Services Consultant, which is a CM firm, and a business development construction for the Small Business Development Program. The services will be performed in accordance with the attachment appendices found uh, in the scope of work for the RFP. There are two separate scopes of work contained within the RFP. That may or may not, MTA may or not, may not choose to award to separate vendors based on an evaluation of the proposals received for each firm using the RFP's evaluation criteria. Scope A is construction management services that will include management of the construction management and mentoring services. They are administered by MTA construction and development and small business unit lead and scope A is responsible to develop under the Small Business Development Program, the ability of the program's participants to perform construction projects for the MTA. Scope B, services that will include the management of the business development mentoring services aspect of the service of the Small Business Development Program, which is administered by Department of Diversity and Civil Rights. Scope B has the overall responsibility to increase the number and capabilities of the MBWBEs, the DBEs, and the SDVOBs and other small businesses to enable them to successfully bid and perform on nine small business development projects as a prime or as a subcontractor. 
DDCR's overall goal within the MTA is to increase the overall participation of small businesses inclusive of MWDBEs and SDVOBs in contract awards. Next slide, please. Sorry, Shuri, if I could just add, you, we do have the RFP schedule timeline um, yes. on the screen. We were anticipating submissions of proposals yes. by April 29th, but I believe yes. that date was just extended. extended. What is the new to date? now Tuesday, May 7th. May sorry. 7th. So we're expecting RFPs, uh, I'm sorry, responses to the RFP by May 7th. I'm not sure if the rest of the schedule will slide. I think, you know, our goal is to try to keep to it as much as possible, but unfortunately we're, we're just having to adjust our timeline. Okay, these next three slides will be highlight will highlight success um, projects for firms that worked in the program under the 2023 Small Business Development Program. This project is Gear Contracting. They are an MWDBE, I'm sorry, MWBE, and they have been in the Tier 1 program for four years, and they are pre-qualified for masonry and finishes trade. This was their first project, so we're happy that they have worked success. Next slide, please. Jam Cobb con Contracting, they are an MBE. They have been pre-qualified pre in Tier 1 for two years, and this was also their first project in a small business development program. So they got, they got in early and got the work done. Next slide, please. And last but not least, we have MIT Brothers Construction. They are an MBE, and they are a current graduate of the Tier 2 program, so they have graduated out of the program and they were awarded two projects in Tier 1 and two projects in Tier 2 for an overall amount of about $5.1 million. We are proud of our firms, and these are our successes. Thank you, and this concludes my presentation. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Cherie. With respect to our workforce data, I will be asking my colleague, Dr. Green, to report. Thank you. As of uh, December 31st, 23, the MTA workforce was comprised of 73,470 employees. 19% of that was female employees and 73% were minority. 3% were uh, veteran employees and 1% were self-identified as persons with disabilities. With compared, when we compare this number to fourth quarter of 2022, our net female representation has increased by 882 employees and our net minority representation increased by 2,094 employees. The complete report of workforce activities can be found in the Diversity Committee book, pages 80 through 93. Page 85 gives a detailed demographic breakdown for employees by agency. We actively monitor agency-wide hires and separations. As of year-end 2023, the workforce data indicated that MTA hired 6,568 employees. Taking our separations into account, this resulted in an increase of 902 females employees and 2,289 minority employees. I'm going to pass it over to Barbara Cockfield to give you an update on some of the ERG, Employee Resource Group Activity. Uh -huh. I do have a question. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm new to the committee. Thank you for the warm welcome. Um, I mean, these, these are um, good stats, um, and, and I. I'm wondering if there's also statistics available on um, salary per, you know, per demographic. So, um, you know, this clearly demonstrates a, you know, a, a diverse composition of the employees. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be, I'd be interested to see to know where, you know, by demographic, um, you know, these groups fall in terms of salary in relation to. We do monitor and track salary by demographic as well. Typically, we do go in and have a separate conversation with the committee on if we're going to publish or speak about the salaries. If, if we do the average salary uh, breakdown by uh, demographic, 
Y and yeah, an anonymized. It doesn't need. To, I'm not looking for everyone's salary. I'm just looking mm -hmm. for an anonymized data, just to give an idea of where we are in terms of equity. You know, not you know on the salary range, not just on the you know workforce composition. Absolutely. Barbara. Next slide, please. For the second year in a row, Begin commemorated the end of Kwanzaa with a traditional gathering to pause, reflect, and celebrate the end of one year and the ushering of a new one. Members of Begin representing employees across the agency joined in the festivities on the evening of January 18th, 2024. Begin observed the Kwanzaa season with a presentation detailing the seven principles of the cultural holiday, which were displayed on the monitors across the agency to celebrate the observance, December 26th through January 1st. Begin also created an article that was highlighted on MTA today. Next slide, please. Begin also highlighted the significance of public transportation and its role in civil rights movement. In February for Black History Month, they had a cultural celebration. A particular focus was placed on individuals who played significant roles in making public transportation accessible as well as opening employment opportunities in the industry. It was a month-long celebration with messages on subway platforms and bus stops. For several weeks, digital messaging across our system reminded millions of customers that February is Black History Month, with portraits and quotes from African-American leaders, heroes, and pioneers. An article in the MTA Today in as well and ended with multimedia cultural celebration. The celebration included guest speaker Jerome Horn of the Maryland Transit Administration. He discussed the intertwined histories of transportation systems, the civil rights movement, African Americans, and notable leaders in the civil rights movement. Next slide, please. In celebration of Women's History Month, Empowering Women in Transportation presented a month-long series entitled Empower Her, Bridging Generations, Building Futures. During the series opening event, a panel discussion was held on how women rise, breaking 12 habits holding you back from your next raise, promotion, or job by Sally Helgenson and Marshall Goldsmith. A distinguished panel of speakers included Dem Demetrius Krishlow, Senior Vice President of Subways, Cassandra Edgehill, Assistant Vice President of Bridges and Tunnels, and Brittany Montgomery, Senior Advisor to the Office of the President of New York City Transit. They also organized a shoe drive in partnership with Soul for Souls, and there were donation boxes located throughout each agency for the collection of donations. Our month ended with the celebration of 24 women for 2024, who were nominated by their respective agencies for their outstanding commitment to empower her. Resilience, commitment to inclusivity, leadership and program development, and empowerment for their roles throughout the MTA. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, we can move on. Thank you. Uh, during our last uh, diversity committee meeting, we had a briefing on our first ever five-year DEI strategic plan. We didn't have it available for distribution, but we do have it today, and we have uh, given each uh, member, board member a, a copy. So the letter from the CEO and our chairman highlights the importance of the plan and clearly communicates and confirms the commitment of the MTA to the implementation of our first ever five-year diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan. The plan was approved for, um, by MTA leadership and we forwarded the plan over to the state in January 2024. So during the month of March, we rolled the plan out to all of the MTA operations and function executives and management and discuss the first year strategies. While we um, have just recently uh, sent the plan over to the state, the actual year of uh, the plan began July 1st, 2023, and the end for the first year is June 30th, 2024. So during the month of April, we have begun to review and chart the progress of our first year activities. This data will detail on the DEI strategic uh, plan on a dashboard, and it will be available and visible to all of our executive and management leadership teams. 
In May, we will conduct focus groups with the ERG members and employees. We will use the feedback from these sessions to contribute to the implementation of our workforce cultural strategies. June through September, we will continue to chart our progress and completion dates as we complete our first year of activities. We will revise our measures and our targets if needed and propose any initiative or budget uh, modifications uh, that may be necessary. In September, our next diversity committee, we will report on our achievements and the challenges during our first year of the diversity uh, strategic initiatives that's found within the plan. I did want to bring your attention to a couple of the pages in the diversity uh, book, I mean the strategic plan book, page 15, which, which actually gives the vision. And this was a vision that's customized and that was developed by uh, the MTA leadership team. And then on page 17, we have customized definitions that are MTA specific of what do we mean when we say diversity, equity, and inclusion. On page 22, the diversity goal alignment with the strategic initiatives. We made, we made sure that all of our, our, our strategic initiatives for the agency were properly aligned with our DEI definitions. And then you'll see on pages 25 through 37 where each agency has their agency specific initiatives that align with each of the diversity goals. Thank you for uh, your attention to uh, this presentation and I'm open for any questions that you may have. I had one that uh, just pops at me. Thank you for putting this together. It's a very thoughtful book and um, I think it uh, comes at a very important time that we recognize diversity of many elements of diversity, including those of views and backgrounds. The, the, the college campuses across this country are, are engulfed in flames uh, like it's 1968, but it's worse because we're turning on ourselves now, not on things happening overseas. It's, it's, a, it's a domestic uh, lack of acceptance that we're seeing. And so um, the notion of diversity, equity, inclusion that includes all groups uh, is very important. Um, one thing that did jump out at me, and maybe it's because I'm becoming, well, as we all do, we age. Uh, page 10, I see a note not only about the age of the interns, upwards of to 89 years old. I'd like to meet our 89-year-old intern. <laughs> what he or she is doing, interning is impressive. But I, it is related to a question, which is, you mentioned Gen X, of which I'm a member being our largest group. I, I, I'd be interested to hear over time how we think about um, older folks in our organization. I, I, hear, I hear a number of comments, and again, as I'm getting older, maybe I'm noticing it more. I'm hearing comments of clients and colleagues talking about ageism in their companies and firms and mm -hmm. how people are better used and later in their careers. And so I, I just, I'm making, asking to make a note, not for today, but to talk about this topic because, you know, being on this committee, you get to think of all different kinds of diversity. I'm a, I'm a Jew. I'm a disabled veteran. Um, I have my own points. You know, my colleague to my, to my right is both Jewish and Chinese, and has is also an enormously talented weightlifter. You're uh, older than me. Right? I am older than you. I am older. Than you. I'm old. You're kind of. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anyway, uh, so how we look at diversity, and I think age is another element we don't really talk about, but it'd be interesting to bring it up at some point. Thank you, we will, and we will brief you on that. I think on my end, one thing to think about is really the role of the board in this plan as well. And I think if that is something we could incorporate um, at some point, I think that would be very helpful um, because we also play a role in this organism, but also within the diversity, inclusion, and equity, so. We definitely will, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rizzo? I think I'm on. 
Okay, thanks so much. Um, I think this is fantastic. I really appreciated reviewing the strategic plan. Uh, one recommendation would be moving forward. You're seeing a lot of the federal agencies over the last two or three years adopt accessibility within the DEI acronym itself. So it's diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And I know that it's mentioned and delineated as a core value, but I think that would be fantastic. So uh, NIH, NSF, DOD, all of the federal agencies are following suit, and I think it would be fantastic for us to do the same. Thank you. We will definitely take that into consideration and, and probably make that modification once we update in, uh, in June, June 30th. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. That concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, we need a motion to adjourn. Second. Meeting's adjourned. Thank you.